Hello, I'm Brian Bailey, editor for Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here today to talk to Bill Neifert, CTO of Carbon Design Systems. So Bill, carbon is very much at the intersection of IP and EDA. Mm -hmm. What things are happening within the IP industry right now which are causing you to perhaps change your focus or the way that you approach things? Well, the biggest change for us has really been the uh, the latest round of, in, in the ARM architecture, and you know so certainly A seventy two plays a part of that. But you know, I I take a step back further from that and, and look at the whole shift to ARM V eight. Uh, you know, with when ARM went to V eight, they introduced a sixty four bit architecture, uh, two maybe you know maybe three bu different bus protocols uh, and the things that go along with it. Uh, this of course made a big change for us. You know, our primary business is focused around people doing ARM based SOC designs. Um, so of course we had to go through and update our models, our infrastructure, and things like that. But we did this um, to help serve our customers who are doing the same thing. And it's been interesting to note how much of a change this has actually uh, had upon our customers as well. Uh, this move from uh, previous 32-bit architectures to 64-bit has caused them to dramatically ch uh, change the verification problems that they have to solve. Um, you know, as, as you migrate from 32 to 64 bits, because their IP has to change as well. It's, it's, it's more strongly introduced this notion of cache coherency uh, as, the, as the problem that everyone has to solve now. It's a problem that, you know, used to mainly be in the realm of the server guys, uh, but, you know, now it's, you know, everyone's got one on their mobile phone. Uh, you know, and so now, now that, that that problem is out there. Uh, and just the whole verification problem that arises as you start moving from a 32-bit infrastructure to a 64-bit infrastructure. You know, this is of course all happening on the hardware side, but then of course it has software implications as well. You know, porting 32-bit software over to be 64-bit compliant, of course, is non-trivial as well. Um, so, uh, you know, since we enable not only the hardware and the architecture guys, but also the software guys, getting them up and running on that has, has been uh, non-trivial. It of course means that our virtual prototypes uh, need to support this. Uh, but then we have to help them through this hump as well. We are oftentimes the first platform that anyone uses to develop software uh, in their system. Uh, and so a lot of the questions that we get directed back to us have nothing to do with our tools. They have to do with, you know, how to program the ARM. How do I, how do I get it to do this? Uh, and that's a whole new learning curve that we've got to come up on as well. So it's been a big, big, big learning curve that we've had to, uh, to, to get over and then work with our customers to do as well. Now, the virtual prototypes that you're creating, the, the, the processor is obviously one piece of that. <clears throat> but, but where does the rest come from? Well, that's going to vary. Um, so, you know, and, and yeah, it's actually interesting. The processor can be one or more pieces in there. No one's just doing a single core processor uh, system anymore. They seem to be moving more and more to these uh, two, four, and eight processor systems. Um, so, of course, we have to incorporate that in, into there. Um, you know, there's always an interconnect and always a memory controller. So even the simplest system has, has those pieces of IP in there. Uh, and for, for your interconnects, you're looking at, you know, most of the standard players in there. ARM, of course, offers their own couple of interconnects, the, uh, uh, the CCN type of stuff or the, or the CCI for the, for the coherent interconnects, and then, you know, the, the, the NIC uh, stuff for, you know, for, for some of your slower peripherals. Uh, but then we also have partnerships in place with, uh, you know, some of the other leading NOC providers like NetSpeed, um, and, and our terrorists to help enable them to get get up involved in that as well. And it's it's interesting, um, uh, you know, the, the the class of problems that, that enables the, the, the customers to solve. And then of course we bring in memory controllers as well. You know, once again, ARM's got some, but uh, you know there are other leading providers um, here also. We we find that you know probably the second most popular or requested piece of IP after after ARM um, are the cadence memory controllers that we integrate into here. So we spend a lot of our time assembling systems um, that contain these various pieces um, all together and then enabling um, you know, our IP partners and system partners to do the same. Um, what, we, what we then find are the next most popular things to try and integrate in are GPUs. Um, you know, and, and this makes a lot of sense. If you look at the problems that SOC designers are trying to solve, it's, it's typically related to memory bandwidth, at least, uh, you know, that they're trying to solve with accurate models. And, you know, after the processor and the memory controller, the GPU is typically the biggest consumer of memory bandwidth inside of the system. So you, you need a way to get that in. And, and this presents an, an interesting uh, problem because uh, unlike the, uh, uh, the, the processor or the fabric and, and the memory controller, there typically aren't models 
um, of, of GPUs that exist out there, um, you know, at least not high-level models. Typically, they only exist as RTL. Um, so many times, the, you know, the only path in for that is, is something using our stuff. Or sometimes people will, will write bus accurate models on there as well. But you know, this, so that this this also means that the the G, getting the GPU into the system as early as possible, um, you know, in, in the virtual prototype is the first handle that people have um, on the impact that it's going to have on the overall system. They can do it standalone and get, try and figure that out. But you really only know the system impact once you start coupling it together with the other components in the, inside of the system, running real system system. Uh, running real system software, you know, and of course that's where we enter the picture. Now, are people using the virtual prototype today just for functionality, or is it expanding out to looking at you know, power architectures and performance? Well, per performance uh, uh, play, plays a, a vital role in that area, but you know, virtual prototypes also play a big role in uh, in software development as well. And it's, it's you know, software, of course, you know, put on your your development hat, software comes in many different flavors, right? You've got your firmware, your drivers, your OS, um, your application layer. Um, different types of virtual prototypes are applicable for each one. Um, if I'm developing high-level software, I don't want an accurate virtual prototype. I don't need that level of accuracy. But if I'm developing drivers or firmware, if I'm doing um, uh, performance analysis and running benchmarks, I probably do want that. Um, so we, we, we find that people uh, will, will bring us in in these cases where they want to solve these problems related to optimizing the performance of their system both at the bare metal level and then the OS level uh, and you know so, and the ability to quickly get them to that point of interest you know be, uh, to you know once you've already booted uh, your OS and then are starting to do that is actually a key bit of a piece of technology and investment that we're constantly having to make and part of why we have to invest as much as we do in the ARM IP because obviously the ability to get the processor to a point where you can start running accurately with it um, is, is the biggest thing that we're always wanting to do. Now when you talk about accuracy, are you talking about functional accuracy or the timing accuracy? Um, yes. Uh, so so it, it's interesting. You always need the functionality. Functionality has to be there. And we actually rely upon our IP partners uh, in that respect to, you know, for a fast, functional, accurate model. But, you know, quite honestly, most of the time when I'm talking about accuracy, I'm really talking about cycle accuracy, the ability to accurately represent the true behavior um, of, the, of the underlying IP. Um, we have a simple approach for that. We compile it from the, from the RTL of the underlying IP. We then spend a lot of time and effort instrumenting that uh, to make sure that not only is it functioning correctly, but you're able to better visualize uh, what's coming out of here. You know, what, what are the cache statistics? What are the, uh, the pipeline statistics? How can you interactively debug that? Uh, you know, that's the technology that we spend a lot of our time working on uh, to do so in such a way that doesn't impact the functionality, uh, but leverages the functionality of the underlying IP. Do you see any value in the sort of approximately timed and loosely timed models, or are they so badly defined that they provide little value? Well, so, so let's, let's separate them out on this. I mean, loosely timed models, we see immense value in. Uh, you know, we, we integrate directly with the loosely timed models uh, from ARM, for example. They're fast models. Without these loosely timed models, we wouldn't be able to do things like our swap and play, the ability to start running fast and then switch over to, to something that's 100% accurate. So, uh, so loosely timed models like that um, are crucial to our business. Uh, approximately timed models, we don't see quite as much, um, and and so let's let's come down to this in, in two different aspects. Approximately time models for existing IP, I see very little drive for uh, from customers, and they spend get you have to spend a lot of time developing them, uh, and in many many ways that's just how inaccurate do you want to be? Um, approximately time models within the realm of being a part of a. IP development flow. So, you know, are you doing synthesis, and do you need to create a uh, a, a a model that you can then uh, integrate integrate in and use as as a driver um, for you know for for high level synthesis? Their approximately time models are great, and I think they're necessary as part of that. But you know, uh, you know, but approximately time models in the in the other realm when they come out for existing IP seem to be of much less value, and and that's certainly not something that I'm getting much of a demand for from my customers. Yes, they always want it to run faster, uh, but when I, I ask them which bits of accuracy they'd really like to get rid of in order to do that, you know, it, it, different pieces of accuracy really matter to, to different people. So, you know, I've, I've 
uh, we've, we've concentrated on more on trying to get the 100% accurate model running as fast as possible. Um, and that seems to be where our customers really, really get value from us. Now, we're here today at DVCon, and, and we've heard an awful lot of System C bashing going on. <laughs> um, and I've been helping do that in some cases. <laughs> well, what do you think <clears throat> is, is the path that System C needs to take in order to become a much, much more useful language and, and standard for building these virtual prototypes? Well, I think actually System C as a language itself is, a, is, a, is a fantastically useful. Um, I think, though, that System C, the methodology, is, is where improvements need to be made. Um, there are issues that come about with System C. You know, we'll go back to approximately timed models there for a second. If I develop an approximately timed model to represent a piece of IP uh, and it's talking over you know, a bus protocol, and I give that to someone else who has also written an approximately timed model to that same bus protocol, the chances of these two models working with, with each other are basically zero because there is no standardized method uh, to represent the same bus protocol uh, inside of TLM2. There's a, a set of uh, standards there that are missing to basically uh, map specific protocols onto TLM2. TLM2 is a great basis um, for a standard, but you've got to put another layer of methodology on top of it. Uh, in addition, say I do get that standard. Say my, my models do work with your models. The, you know, the, the ability to control and inspect these um, is not standardized. So, you know, the, the ability to, get, you know, to go in, find out what's going on inside this model, debug this model, uh, integrate it with the others, also is a standard that needs to be done out there. So if you're, if you're really looking at what's necessary to get system C to that next level and make it a lot more useful, I think the standardization needs to be done um, in, those, in those two areas in order to really start affecting that. Um, the problem, though, is is you know there's going to be no there's going to be very little push to do this unless can someone can figure out a way to make money off of it um, unless it's going to be a, you know, an entirely nonprofit effort to do all of this and and of course uh, you know EDA companies are, are, aren't going to sink a whole bunch of time and effort uh, into doing something on which they can't make money on so it's uh, uh, you know it's a bit a bit, bit of weighing weighing one off against the other there's got to be a way to come up with a way to, to make these things a standard to help enable System C to be much more valuable, but also come up and do it and do it in such a way that uh, someone, uh, you know, I assume the EDA companies would like it to be them, uh, can figure out a way to actually make money off of it. So is this the reason why, uh, after an initial surge of interest in System C, it's sort of the standardization process has been, as some people have described, glacial? <laughs> I, I certainly think that you could, you could look at that as, as an indicator. I don't think it's a weakness of System C as, as a language itself. I think System C uh, is, is, is very powerful in what it can do and what it's capable of. Um, you know, the monetization story, I think you, you could certainly look at um, as being one on why it's taken so long to actually get these standards to go forward. There are a lot of, there are, there are a lot of competing interests in, in place as well, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of it comes back to money. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity.